Hello everyone, you are listening to Expert Consultations with Psychopharmacology Institute. I'm Dr. Wagdan Rashad, and today we'll be discussing broad spectrum micronutrients with Dr. Amelia Villa Gomez. Dr. Villa Gomez is a child and adolescent psychiatrist in clinical practice and co director of the Integrative Psychiatry Program at the University of Arizona. Dr. Villa Gomez gave a two part lecture that you can find on our website that eloquently introduced the concept of micronutrient deficiencies in psychiatry and the role of broad spectrum micronutrient supplementation. Today's interview is specifically about when and how supplementation can be helpful in patients with psychiatric diagnoses such as ADHD. But before we do get into the specifics of the clinical use of BSMs, what are broad spectrum micronutrients and what specific agents are we gonna be addressing primarily? Great question. BSMs or broad spectrum micronutrients. So different groups and different research groups will use different cutoff points for how they define and how many vitamins and minerals need to be in something called a broad spectrum micronutrient. But one commonly accepted definition is having at least 10 different vitamins and minerals in a formulation. The broad spectrum products that have been most studied, replicated and used in different research studies and by different research groups have been called Daily Essential Nutrients and EM Power Plus. And the idea behind broad spectrum micronutrients is that a single ingredient strategy for nutritional treatments is at odds with human physiology as optimal human functioning requires the presence of all nutrients in balance rather than one nutrient provided in high doses. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. And I just want to make clear up front that I have no financial disclosures to make. I'm paid by neither of these companies. I have no financial interest in either of the companies that we're going to be talking about. And that's very purposeful because I want to be able to speak from a non-biased perspective. And not only myself, but the researchers that have looked at these products and researched them have nothing to gain from them financially and have not been paid by the companies. I'm really glad you mentioned that part. I guess one takeaway from what you shared with us is that to be considered a broad spectrum, we need at least 10 different multivitamins and minerals. I think I also want to perhaps echo some perspectives of folks who might not have access to these specific brands that you mentioned. What would be the next best thing or are over-the-counter multivitamins okay to use instead? So I think this is a really good question and really where we need a lot more research because I don't think we have a definitive answer. So first, I want to say the advantage of these two products is that they've been studied repeatedly over the past few decades. And the formulation has changed slightly in order to require fewer pills. The difference between the broad spectrums and something over the counter is that they have considerably larger doses of vitamins and minerals. And of the two, Daily Essential Nutrients has a larger dose of vitamins and minerals compared to EM Power Plus Advanced. Having said that, I do not think we can take the studies that we've talked about and say they translate directly to saying that all vitamins and minerals that we get over the counter would help somebody. As far as disadvantages of using broad spectrums compared to something over the counter's costs, like we talked about. And another disadvantage would be the need for closer monitoring when using broad spectrums because they do contain vitamins and minerals in doses above the recommended daily allowance. You also mentioned in the lecture three new RCTs in 2023 that explore BSMs in pregnant women, adults with depression and anxiety, and teens with mood difficulties. What are some of the results of these studies, if they're out yet, and that we can use to supplement what we already know about their role? So we are still waiting for two of these studies to be published, but one that we can talk about that was published in 2023 was the NOMAD study. And that was looking at the efficacy and safety of the broad spectrum micronutrients for symptoms of anxiety and depression in adults. So this was a randomized placebo-controlled trial, and they recruited 150 adults ages 18 to 65, and they gave the placebo versus the daily essential nutrients. And these were not people that had a formal DSM diagnosis, or I should say they didn't assess using DSM, but the people were presenting with functionally impairing symptoms of anxiety and depression. In this study, there were no serious adverse effects, specifically no sexual side effects. There were increased number of bowel movements, but otherwise there was really not a difference in side effects between the groups. 
the blind was adequately maintained, the dropout rate was quite low, 8.7%, and the primary outcomes were the PHQ, the GAD7, and the CGI. This study had a really high placebo response. And you wonder why the placebo response was so high. And I think part of it might have been that they were encouraging these people to have food and water three times a day because you need to take food and water with the micronutrients to avoid stomach upset. So that might have been one reason. And there were no group differences at endpoint with both groups showing improvement. However, those receiving the micronutrients improved significantly more quickly for symptoms of anxiety and depression. The really interesting insight in this study comes from looking at the subgroup analysis. The study showed that there were differential improvements depending on group assignment. The modeling demonstrated that younger patients and those who had previously trialed psychiatric medications and participants from lower socioeconomic status groups benefited from a stronger micronutrient effect. And I think that's an important point. There was a greater difference between placebo and micronutrients for patients who had already tried psychotropic medication. And so this may suggest that micronutrients may help people who have failed to respond to other therapies, perhaps because it offers a different mechanism of action. Certainly, we need more studies, but these were the highlights that we see in this 2023 study. Now, as our listeners here are thinking, what kind of patient would benefit most from BSMs? So I'll first start with what the research says. I think the biggest thing that's been looked at over and over is kids who struggle with emotional regulation, mm -hmm. right? And that's transdiagnostic, but that's something that is the core of what we see. The other thing that I will say is clinically, people who are motivated to take them, because it is a lot to ask a patient to take with EM Power Plus, it's two to three capsules, two to three times a day, depending on dose and age. And with daily essential nutrients, the dose, depending on age, can be nine to 12 capsules a day. So that's a large thing to ask somebody to do. So I would say number one is motivation. Ideally, if they can swallow pills, it does come in a powder version too, but it's often very hard to motivate somebody to take a powder and mix it in water and give it three times a day. That certainly is more laborsome. And then I would say, going back to this choice piece, people who want to use a treatment, who have a belief that nutrition can improve their mental health. And I'll add one more thing, which is I think somebody who has good GI functioning already. If somebody has a lot of stomach aches and a lot of bloating and diarrhea, and there's already something going on gut-wise with them, adding in more vitamins and minerals that might feed that unhealthy microbiome presumably a hypothesis there, they may have more side effects there. It certainly doesn't mean that nutrition is not important, but maybe in that sort of patient, I would look more closely at what they're eating, looking at stress, trying to figure out GI-wise what's going on before adding on something that could potentially exacerbate a GI issue that's already there. And I'm sure you get this question a lot of like, how long do I need to be on these multivitamins for? So I share with patients what we know. And then we figure the rest out from there, thinking about risk benefit. Mm -hmm. So basically, we have RCTs that are 12 weeks, and we have some data looking a year, and then small data looking longer than that. So what I typically say for families who want to try this is that we do a trial, and we see how they're doing. Yeah. Meanwhile, we are trying to improve their nutrition and once they're starting to feel better, and we are working with psychotherapy, and we're doing all of these other adjunctive treatments and then after people are feeling well, then we decide, do we continue taking them? Do we try to reduce the number of pills? And so I think that this is a hard question to answer because we just don't have the exact research to guide us. But what I often see clinically is that kids and adults get tired of taking pills and they often reduce themselves without me saying anything. <laughs> And some people say, oh, I didn't take the bottle for a week and I still felt great. And so I stopped taking it and I'm still doing well. Great. And that's where we stop. Mm -hmm. Well, other people will say, I stopped taking them and that vacation was the worst ever. And we called and we got the supplement sent within 24 hours. And now we know how helpful they really are. Oh, excellent. So in real life, it really is about tailoring the experience to the patient and how they're feeling and their experience with pills as well. One thing that did come to mind as we were talking about suitability is a question about deficiency and toxicity. So 
Regarding deficiency, would you routinely do blood work to pick up on deficiencies? And then the second part of my question is, what is the risk of vitamin or mineral toxicity with BSMs? I think those are really great questions. So the first one, as far as screening blood work, I think that we get in our training that we should be looking at those levels that we can, right? We should be looking for anemia, checking a fasting ferritin level, looking for 25-hydroxyvitamin D level, potentially depending on if the patient's on medication already that could deplete magnesium levels, perhaps we should be checking those things. We know that PPIs can decrease magnesium levels. But as far as specifically around side effects to broad spectrums and screening and continuing monitoring, What the research has shown is that generally there's very mild side effects if people have them. And that can be like transient headaches, which can improve with hydration, can be insomnia because for some people taking B vitamins can be energizing. Loose stools can happen, nausea, dyspepsia, flatulence, and typically worse if you're combining it with something that already has GI side effects or pre-existing GI dysfunction. Also, anything that can help some people can make some people worse. I think that's a true principle in medicine. So some people can get worse taking micronutrients. They can have anxiety or agitation if the dose is too high. And so I think that you have to monitor. I don't think this is one of those things where you say, here, go pick up the prescription, see you in six months thing. The other thing that can happen is neon yellow urine from harmless riboflavin excretion. So that's what I would say for short-term studies that we see. As far as toxicity, like I mentioned to date, no serious adverse events have been attributed to broad-spectrum micronutrients, but they were done in people typically who weren't taking other medications and were, for the most part, physically healthy. So we also have to consider, like we talked about in the lecture, any contraindications for using them, right? This is not something you'd want to give to somebody who has hemochromatosis or Wilson's disease, or severe liver disease, or severe renal disease, because they're not going to be able to metabolize and excrete correctly. And then you will have a risk for toxicity. So I invite the viewers to like review that part that we went into detail around contraindications. Also, it seems reasonable to recommend screening for metabolic and electrolyte abnormalities before starting treatment. Screening may include a CBC, CMP, calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, copper, and ceruloplasm, vitamin B12, folate, and iron studies. So before we go, what, in your opinion, are the most important BSM drug interactions that you think all psychiatrists should know? Great question. I think that as far as the drug interactions, the number one thing is to know that they can be there. Right. And in all of the studies that were done, specifically the randomized control studies, they were only looking in patients who were not taking any medications and who were healthy. It's from clinicians using micronutrients in clinical practice that there have been reported repeated observations that broad spectrum micronutrients potentiate or amplify the actions of psychotropic medications. And so dosing may need to be adjusted if combining with psychotropic medication. It's also things that affects the CNS, like levothyroxine, glucocorticoids. Those would also be considered psychotropic. So I think that's a big caveat to this whole piece is that we need more research looking at real world studies of people who were taking medications and how to adjust those. I think that's an important thing that we're lacking and that we need more of. Thank you so much for speaking with us today and teaching us about broad spectrum micronutrients. We hope to have you again on Psychopharmacology Institute. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. All right. Thanks for listening. And until next time, goodbye. Goodbye.